speak to uh, Robert Buckland, who is the Justice Secretary. We've got so much to talk to you about, too. We've got the test and trace system that has failed. Uh, we've got the amber uh, problem with all the holidays. But let's just pick up on what we were just hearing there, Robert Buckland, this morning. Um, what is the government's point of view about where this leaves the BBC? Many people who are already uh, waning in their love of the BBC will use this as a stick to bash them with anyway because they think that we shouldn't have to pay the licence fee. But actually, the BBC is an incredibly important institution in the UK's landscape. Uh, where does the government stand this morning on what this means uh, about reviewing uh, the licence? Well, I agree with you. It is a very important organisation. It embodies freedom of expression and freedom of speech, but it also has a wider responsibility to all of us uh, to behave in, 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 to a high standard. And my colleague, the Culture Secretary, Oliver Dowden, has rightly said that uh, we should uh, look at the governance structures of the BBC. We'll take time to do that. The report that Lord Dyson issued yesterday is 127 pages long, so that needs to be looked at very carefully. And there may be issues issues that uh, Lord Dyson uh, wasn't asked to cover that need to be looked at more widely. So a very serious moment for the BBC. They've apologised, which is uh, appropriate, but uh, clearly the, the, the wider issues of governance and the way things are run now need to be looked at. Your Justice Secretary, you know all about the law, uh, Robert, and there is always a complicated relationship between any government of any political colour and the BBC and the freedom of the press. Um, does this make you feel like the government should get more involved? Uh, what do you think should happen next in terms of the government's looking into this? Well, I think there needs to be a very clear distinction to be drawn between operational and journalistic independence and freedom of expression that, you know, that you do and that other broadcasters do, and indeed newspapers as well and media outlets, and then the way things are run, the governance, uh, to coin a phrase. Yeah. And that's important because this is a public institution. L l licence payers fund the BBC. It's independent, but it has to meet high standards. And, you know, reading that report, reading the summary, shows that, sadly, there was a departure from those high standards that needs to be addressed. Uh, talking of high standards, of course, <clears throat> the government is no exception to that. Um, in terms of communicating uh, to uh, billions of people who are looking at their holidays where to go and how to go about it if they want to go abroad, uh, many would say that the government has failed, actually. Um, there are 1,300 flights over the next five days going out to amber-listed countries. 270,000 Brits are going to be boarding those planes to go to amber countries, which the government has specifically said, do not go to. What is your message to those people today? Well, look, I, I think my, my message is simple. The guidance is there. Of course, countries uh, come off uh, the various colours. So, you know, what is amber now might not be the case uh, once evidence is looked at. But it, well, I think it's important to draw a distinction between the guidance that we've given and then the rules that apply for people who are travelling to these countries. So if it's a green country, you know, enjoy yourself, have a nice holiday, come back. You don't have to self-isolate or go to a quarantine hotel. If you're going to an amber country, country, you have to self-isolate after you come back. That's the, that's the law. Um, and uh, I think that, you know, the, the fact that we've got those different uh, regimes is important because that's the way that we seek to yeah. control any spread I mean, of the virus. The problem is, Robert, is, is that I'm not sure the guidance is clear because Boris Johnson said only go if it's very extreme, like a family member is sick. There's 270,000 people uh, likely in the next five days, I don't imagine it's going to come off those countries will change their position in that five days. You know, they're going to go out there and they can't all have, I hope not anyway, seriously ill family members. So how are you going to check? Have you got the resources to check that they're all doing the right thing when they get back? Well, I indeed. I mean, the police are working hard on it. We've got extra people uh, employed to uh, literally knock doors as well to make sure that uh, self-isolation is being adhered to. And uh, 280, nearly 280,000 worth well, of doors to be knocked. 
<laughs> Look, I, I absolutely accept this is a big job. I mean, I think a lot of people can be relied upon to do the right thing uh, when they come back and self-isolate. Um, I think we've just got to keep on repeating those messages. You know, green is go, enjoy yourself. Uh, amber is a no. Do you think um, it's irresponsible I'm... of people to go to amber countries at the moment? Well, look, I'm not going to sort of sit here and judge people. I think, no, I think you are going to send be... people around to knock on their door, so essentially you are judging them. Well, no, what we're saying is there that that's the law. You know, when you come back, you've got to abide by the law and we're applying the law. The the, the guidance about travel is something that uh, I think is very much, uh, you know, in the spirit of what we've tried to do throughout this crisis, to uh, trust the judgment of people and to absolutely what encourage the right you can't afford to self-isolate? And you certainly couldn't have afforded to lose out on thousands of pounds for a holiday that companies are, you know, holiday companies aren't refunding because it's not illegal to go. So what do you expect people to do to either flout the law uh, because they feel they have no choice some people might say that's the wrong thing to say but perhaps that is I think how people will feel they'll think look it's thousands of pounds who on earth is really going to check on me if I go and walk the dog or if I you know pop out to the shops when I get back what, what, what I'd say is that I, I do think people should obey the law and uh, tempting as it might be and I know in some circumstances people face real pressures uh, look at the uh, support and help that is available and do that self-isolation you're not just doing it for yourself you're doing it for friends you're doing it for your community it's the right thing to do it's the responsible thing to do and you know it's that sort of tone of encouragement that I've always ap applied throughout this crisis because I trust people to do the right thing. How are they going to isolate on their way home from the airport, on trains, tubes, buses? Well, I, I think that uh, um, all of us will have you know, particular arrangements that uh, will allow either travel with a, a member of the bubble or, or indeed the sort of um, uh, travel to minimise the risk of inadvertent contact, wearing masks but and all those important things. If you sit on a things. train or a bus, and I, and I use those <laughs> in the days when we could travel, uh, yeah. they're always very crowded because people are rushing for certain points. So, you know, how are they going to manage to do that? Well, I, th I think we, we have to accept that people need to get home. Uh, and, uh, so they you know, can't, then? Well, uh, you know, I, I, think, I think we accept the point that you've got to travel home, and then once you're home, you know, to travel with wearing but a mask, you've done all the right things. This is where it's, where it's this a is problem. Where it's people are losing livelihoods because of that situation, but they're still being forced into a potentially dangerous one for those travelling on those modes of transport? Well, look, I, I think it does all go back to decisions that people make. I know that you've you know, you rightly said a lot of people are, have been planning holidays, but in the vast majority of people are not doing that. Uh, you know, they, they've looked at the guidance, they've, they've made a judgment. A lot of people are booking gonna... new holidays. The, the issue is, of course, is that what, was the, what is the point of an amber list? I really oh, struggle to understand this. What? Why not just have a green list and a red list so people know go or don't go? What is the point of dangling this carrot of countries that might or might not be green in two weeks' time? You've got a holiday booked and you think, well, I'll just risk it, otherwise I'll lose my money. The holiday companies don't know whether to refund you or not because no. the government says it's not illegal to go. So they think, well, why should we lose out? There's no real health There's in the no There's no clarity industry. and there's no commitment You literally from the call the situation where people are having to choose between mm -hmm. losing money or breaking the law. And frankly, it's outrageous. Well, I, I, with respect, I really don't agree with that. I mean, I think, I think having an amber system is sensible because the rules there don't require people to go into a hotel. You know, if you're on a red system, you've got to go no, into no, just, one just of those answer. hotels. Around this point, because I think that's what's at the heart of people's concern. You know, they have a choice. They've rebooked and rebooked holidays that they all paid for before the mm. pandemic. They're now get, not having the chance to get their money refunded because it's not illegal to go there, so the holiday companies can't refund it. Or to it. move it costs thousands of pounds. Move it costs... We, we've spoken to many people, it costs £900,000 more pounds to move 900 it. £900, pounds, yeah. Yeah, £900 pounds or 1000 or more to move it in many, many cases. 270,000 people will be getting on a flight in the next five days, unsure whether to lose their livelihoods potentially when they come back, take risks on transport as they come back or lose money from holidays. But, but, but I think the important point that the Amber List offers is indeed those uh, necessary journeys, either because a family member is very ill or close to death or something has died. There can't be 270,000 necessary journeys. And for all those people who... Have, that's still not answering the point. It's about you've booked your money, you've paid your price before the pandemic, you haven't done anything silly like book it during it. 
There's lots and lots of people who are in that position and lots and lots of people are not supported at home by their employers because they're working in an independent way and they have to make that choice. What is the clarity and what's the point of the Amber List? Well, as I've said, the Amber List does allow for necessary journeys if you're working or if there's a, a really pressing family commitment that can't be put back. And I think, therefore, it's right to have, rather than a binary system, you know, either red or green, you've got that middle tier, which does allow for at least some essential travel with, then, the requirement to isolate at the end of it. Well, I think I think it's a complete rightly... neglect of the reality. It's a well, sort of hiding behind right. policy and hiding behind words, not true looking in the face of the reality of what's going to happen in the next five days. Uh, but no, we not, shall have not, to leave it there because we have asked you several times to explain the relevance of the Amber List. Um, people at home can decide whether they are satisfied with your answers. Well, if uh, I could get a word in edgeways, then I would have given well, an answer. you've had a full Thanks. interview, sir. So thank, thank you. you for joining us on the show. That's Robert Buckland, the Justice Secretary. He's off. He's off.